So maybe you've seen one in the news in the last few weeks, or maybe you and your family have personally experienced the newest kind of parade sweeping the nation as we are sheltered in, the school parade. Teachers and administrators of school have been decorating their cars and cruising the neighborhoods of their students, waving and smiling at their pupils as they sit on their porch or on their lawn, waving and yelling back. Long lines of SUVs covered in twisty crepe paper streamers, balloons flying from the doors and windows painted with messages of love, support, and school spirit as school closures are going from that initial prediction of just a few weeks, we'll be back after spring break, don't worry about it, to now closing for the rest of the year in many cases. There's no contact, there's no throwing of beads or candy, or even of homework. No high-fiving. This is a bizarre take on a parade, but it's the kind of interaction the students and teachers have been craving during these weeks of distance learning and Chromebook checkouts and zooming in. Have you ever tried to zoom in with a bunch of kindergartners? It's just exactly the way you would imagine it to be. Blessings on their teachers. Today, our tradition remembers another odd parade, one that's referred to as triumphal, despite its humble trappings. There are no floats, no roses, no massive balloons soaring over the crowds, no beads being thrown, no rainbows, no high school marching bands or dance troops. Rather, it's a man coming into Jerusalem, some crowds going ahead of him, some laying their garments on the road, along with branches from trees. The crowds are following him and shouting, Hosanna in the highest heaven. The closest to our own familiar parade theatrics that this one comes is that he is, if we're to read and take Matthew literally, he's riding a colt and a donkey at the same time. I mean, you get this image, right, of like one leg on each side of it, you know, kind of surfing through the crowd or water skiing or perhaps laying on across. It's, it's bizarre, but we'll take it for what it is because it's parade-like, right? But really, what kind of parade is this anyway? It's obvious that no permit from the city was acquired. Streets were not blocked off hours ahead. There was no police force working in tandem with the parade organizers to keep people from their path. No one sitting at the corner announcing, oh, and here comes Jesus Christ. It looks like he's got a full crowd. Are those palm branches that they're waving? How innovative. None of that's happening. However, we shouldn't step off on this parade route assuming that Jesus didn't have it all worked out. His triumphal entry was calculated. He may not have had the JROTC Color Guard, Lowrider Car Club, and the Chihuahua Playgroup, or the mayor in a convertible at the front of the parade, but he had a plan for how his arrival for this final trip to Jerusalem would take place. While Jesus was arriving at one end of Jerusalem, his ragtag group of peasants and outcasts all coming from the east, Pontius Pilate would have been coming from the west, we all know that name Pilate, but for a quick history refresher, here's how he fits into this story. Jerusalem is occupied. It is under Roman rule. Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan explain this domination system in their book, The Last Week. And essentially, there are different levels of power in Jerusalem at this time. Locally, powerful Jewish leaders were chosen by Rome to handle the local governmental issues. These are your King Herods and your Caiaphases. And during Jesus' lifetime, the temple had become where local Jewish government collaborated with Rome. So according to Borg and Crossan, it had the defining features of ancient domination systems, ruled by a few, economic exploitation and religious legitimation. The high priests were in charge of mediating between their Jewish subjects and Rome, and keeping peace often meant dealing with the people who might cause Rome to retaliate 
and destroy all of Jerusalem. So they had a very delicate position to be in there. It is within this context, it's with this context in mind that we see entering on stage left Pontius Pilate as Jesus is entering from stage right. Pilate is the governor over the area, a Roman, and he is coming into Jerusalem ahead of the Passover celebrations, which drew thousands and thousands and thousands of pilgrims to the temple. Did anyone catch Ten Commandments last night on TV? Well, if we all remember our Char Charlton Heston correctly, the Passover is the remembrance of Israel's freedom from the bondage of Egyptian rule and enslavement. So you see how it's imperative for Pilate to assert a Roman presence during this time to say, okay, okay, you guys can celebrate your festival, but no fun funny business because Rome is in charge here. Pilate's parade looks a little more like the parade we would expect. He's coming into town with the chariots, the armed guard. There's probably some like Miss America style elbow waving. I've never been able to get that down. And he comes in with his lavishly decorated processional. Jesus's cloaks and branches on the ground was a stark and immediately obvious contrast to what was coming in from the West. When Rome entered Jerusalem, opulence, excess, and the trappings of colonial rule were all present. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, there was little fanfare, and yet we still remember his parade to this day. The humble minimalism indicating to those who were aware of scripture and prophets that this man riding a donkey and a colt, and a colt were prophesied to be the king, the king of Jerusalem, the Lord. In this light, Jesus' entry looks a little bit more like a political rally or a rights march. We are very familiar with those images. While our Matthew reading does not say what kind of branches were used, we get from the Gospel of John that they used palms. We see a humble but brilliant antagonist riding into Jerusalem and his followers dangerously risking retribution from both Jewish and Roman leadership because this could really upset the apple cart. Knowing, and they're knowing that this is more than just dancing in the streets and throwing leaves all around. This act, this parade, this triumphal entrance is a political statement. It is the political statement. And what are the people shouting? Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Or if you grew up on Jesus Christ Superstar, you're probably singing to yourself, Hosanna, hey, Zanna, 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 ho. Am I right? I know at least one or two people are singing that with me. Now, maybe I've zoned out for a few too many times during sermons on Palm Sunday. It's easy. It's easy to do because I sometimes get taken in by the dazzling sight of the children entering with palms, singing, and the fanfare of the morning for this little tidbit to fit in, to sink in. So forgive me if this isn't new information to you, but do you know what Hosanna means? Hosanna's like, not, yay, let's party, Jesus is here. Like, I think we sometimes might hear it and interpret it and portray it as we're walking through with our palm branches. But it's an exclamation that is crying out for saving. Jewish New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine explains in her book, Entering the Passion of Jesus, that Hosanna is a Hebrew term that means literally save, please, or in more formal terms, save, we pray. Well, on the other end of the city of Jerusalem, Roman forces are arriving to remind the occupied Jewish people who they must submit to. Jesus' followers are coming in and shouting, shouting, they're not keeping it on the down, though. 
They are screaming and yelling for salvation. We must never forget that in the midst of this triumphal entry, Jesus is riding into town aware that this political march on Jerusalem is the first step toward his death. The first step toward what he must do in order to hear those hosannas and take their prayer for salvation seriously. While we are sheltered in place, how might our own hosannas ring out? When we've come together for Palm Sunday in the past, perhaps our hosannas have come across as tenny because we each have our own personal struggles, but what have we corporately needed saving from? This year, as we wave our branches at home, separated from our community, our hosannas have more depth. COVID-19 is getting personal now as the wave of those sick is mounting and we're beginning to hear from people we know and they are telling us what that feels like, that experience of the headache, the sore throat, the underwater feeling of not being able to take a deep enough breath. Some of us have been home for weeks, alone. Some of us don't have the luxury of staying home and we are facing infection due to the shortage of proper protective equipment in our workplaces. And while our children are sitting in the yard, waving at their teachers as they parade by at a safe distance, our own hosannas are on our lips, meaningful as ever. Save us, we pray. Amen.